What do you expect for something near the literal edge of the observable universe? Picture yourself witnessing the birth of these cosmic behemoths billions of years ago. Did you know that the light emitted from some distant galaxies holds the secrets to the origins of supermassive black holes? Join the conversation. What do you think triggered the formation of the most distant black hole we've semi-directly detected? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Your insights could be the missing piece to this cosmic puzzle. Don't miss the chance to contribute to the conversation and connect with fellow space enthusiasts. Don't forget to hit that like button if you're fascinated by the wonders of the universe and subscribe to our channel for more mind-blowing space discoveries. Together, let's unravel the mysteries of the cosmos, introducing Abel 2744. It's a giant cluster of galaxies around 4 billion light years away. Basically our backyard, cosmologically speaking. The most interesting thing about Abel 2744, at least for us today, isn't what's in the cluster itself, but what's behind it. The cluster lives in a vast halo of dark matter that warps space across its 4 million light year span. Light from distant objects traveling through the cluster is deflected and magnified. The cluster is a stupendous gravitational lens that enables us to see much further than our puny human-made telescopes would normally allow. That's why the Hubble Space Telescope studied Abel 2744 in detail and why it was one of the early must-dos for the James Webb Space Telescope. And this is where our smudge got interesting. JWST observes deep into infrared wavelengths and showed that the object has IR colors consistent with a galaxy whose normally visible light has been stretched out by the expanding universe, increasing or redshifting its wavelength by a factor of over 10. Higher redshift means larger distance, and a redshift of 10.1 means this light has been traveling for around 13.2 billion years, coming to us from a time near the beginning of time when the universe was less than 3.5% its current age. That earned our smudge the name UHZ-1 for ultra-high redshift galaxy number one, where the Z is the symbol for redshift. That's cool, but JWST has now found galaxies quite a bit more distant than this. The really exciting moment came when we pointed another orbiting satellite at the smudge. This is the image by the Chandra X-ray telescope. As matter swirls towards the black hole, it's superheated until it outshines the entire surrounding galaxy. And just before it reaches the black hole, conditions get so crazy that the space outside the black hole glows bright with high-energy X-rays. Based on the amount of X-ray light and the distance, we can estimate that the black hole must be 40 million times the sun's mass. That's 10 times the mass of the Milky Way's own SMBH. Essentially, every galaxy in the modern universe has at its core a black hole that's 100,000 to several billion times the mass of the Sun. We also see much smaller black holes, so-called stellar black holes, that can be in the rough range of 10 to 100 solar masses. Oddly, we don't see black holes in the middle range of 100 to 100,000. We'll come back to why that's odd. Now, we know how to make stellar black holes. They're what you get when the core of a massive star collapses on itself after the star dies. So how do you make supermassive black holes grow? That's the big question. It could be that they grew from the very first stellar corpses in the early universe, gulping down gas and merging with other black holes for billions of years to reach their current enormous sizes. But over the last decade or so, as we looked to greater and greater distances, we started to find quasars shining out from the first billion years of cosmic time. Quasars powered by supermassive black holes that should not have had enough time to get that big. There are two potential solutions to this conundrum. Either the black holes started small and grew way, way faster than we thought they could, or they started much bigger than the black holes that form in stellar deaths in the modern universe. 
These are the small seed and heavy seed models, respectively. UHZ1 is going to help us choose between them. Let's start with the small seed model. Can a stellar corpse grow into a quasar engine in less than a billion years? Well, it's tricky. There's a limit to how fast a black hole can feed, even with an endless supply of gas. As gas spiraling into a black hole heats up, it blasts out radiation, which pushes on the infalling gas and counters the black hole's gravity. Bigger black holes can eat more and radiate more, but there's always an approximate upper limit that increases with that mass. It's called the Eddington limit. You can calculate how big a black hole would grow, feeding at this maximum rate for a billion years. And the answer is not big enough to explain those early quasars. That said, there are various tricks we can include to make the small seed model work. There are scenarios in which black holes can feed faster than the Eddington limit, although they still need to feed non-stop to reach supermassive status so quickly, which itself is a problem. Or you can form a lot of black holes close to each other and have them merge very quickly. Or you can start out with really, really big stars leaving behind black holes that are maybe 100 or even 1,000 times larger than are produced today. In the modern universe, all the heavy elements released in past supernovae cause gas clouds to fragment as they collapse, leading to smaller stars. But the pristine hydrogen and helium that filled the universe at the beginning held together as it collapsed, probably leading to gigantic stars and commensurately massive but still not supermassive black holes. With a combination of these tricks, fast and consistent feeding and biggish stellar black hole seeds, it's possible to make supermassive black holes in under a billion years. Okay, so let's try the heavy seed model. What if the seeds of supermassive black holes weren't even born from the hyper-dense cores of dead stars? In fact, it's actually a misconception that you need extremely dense matter to make a black hole. For any given mass, there's a particular size that mass needs to be crushed into in order for it to form a black hole. This is the Schwarzschild radius. For the Sun, it's around three kilometers, and a solar mass crammed within that radius would have the same density as a typical 3,000 meter tall mountain crammed into a cubic centimeter. On the other hand, a typical chunky supermassive black hole of a billion solar masses has a Schwarzschild radius the size of Neptune's orbit. A billion suns crammed into that region would have the density of cotton candy. That's right, fill a solar system with cotton candy and you'd get an instant giant black hole. The early universe did not contain significant quantities of cotton candy, as far as we can tell anyway but it was filled with a lot of gas that would later form stars and galaxies. What are your thoughts on this? Share your insights in the comments below. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications by pressing the bell icon so you never miss a captivating moment of discovery.